Good evening. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone who's here because uh, you give me a great opportunity to share this journey with you, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to doing that. Please tweet. There are Twitter handles and tags and hashtags along everything. Um, I'm at Maria Ingold, so please uh, tweet about all the things that you see and that you think are interesting to share. So I grew up in New Mexico where they dropped the atom bomb. I think that explains a lot. <laughs> My uh, father mostly raised me. Uh, this is him with a shooting prohibited sign and four guns. So he's a rocket scientist, genuinely. He worked on Apollo 13 and uh, increased the accuracy of the landing rockets from 200 miles to three miles. That saved the lives of the astronauts. And he also speaks seven languages fluently, is restoring 17 cars, and built our cabin off grid. So 40 years ago, it looked like this. This is where he started. It now looks like this. He built it entirely by hand using calculus, trigonometry, uh, uh, physics uh, for torque and uh, all of that. Also a lot of physical strength and a lot of creativity. And of course he did the whole solar thing back when it was hippie and not hip like it is now. So that's me. This is why I'm wearing a red turtleneck. <laughs> so um, he, he raised me with the idea that you should question everything continuously. And it was great growing up with him because uh, he was like Google. I could just ask him, hey, Dad, why is the sky blue? And he'd be like, here's a prism. Let me explain light refraction to you. So he was passionate about absolutely everything, and he shared that passion with me. And that ranged from everything, you know, he, he even liked uh, drawing feet, writing poetry, and of course he shared his love of technology with me. So being brought up in that environment, I went on to university and studied computer science and fine art. Now I went to school in America where they let you do diverse topics like that. And when I studied computer science, there were 40% women. And I think having that diversity really helps in, um, in, in, in being able to study those disparate topics, really helps later on in things like lateral innovation. So I went on from there to uh, work for IBM. I worked in the beginnings of multimedia on audio and video. I then worked in computer games all this time as a programmer. I then moved from just being a programmer into understanding the bigger picture and eventually became a CTO. So I was a CTO uh, more recently for Filmplex Movies. I built the video on demand film service for Virgin Cable uh, and Channel 4's Film 4 on demand service. And then I've um, since then take, taken that expertise and three and a half years ago I set up my own company which is called My Reality. And My Reality is a world where there is technology and creativity. And I've now I consult in video on demand, uh, both technically and strategically, and in Internet of Things, which includes the, the gamut of smart home and wearable technology. So that for me is, again, it's all about the aspect of being able to have diversity. So I've worked through this entire, uh, I've, I've lived through this entire life cycle of getting, getting interested in technology, um, entering into the technology workforce as a woman, and then staying in it and advancing in it. So that's what I'm going to uh, talk you through today. But why should we care about this? Well, this number right behind me is how many, sort of 1.2 million, is how many people are uh, currently in IT and telecoms in the UK. Now this number, just under 200,000, is how many of them are women. And this number here, almost three quarters of a million, is how many people we need in the UK who have the ability to, to, do, uh, to understand digital technology. The problem is, that we don't have that many people going in to study it at the moment. So we've got fewer than 30,000 uh, 
people in total who, who are interested in studying uh, computer science and engineering and tech. But out of that, we've got fewer than 5,000 people who are, uh, who are women. So how do, what do we do to start changing that? Well, one of the things to do to start changing that is to go back to being a child. So what, what motivates us as children? What motivates us is curiosity and wonder. Curiosity leads to a desire to learn. Wonder leads to passion. Passion is something both of the other speakers have mentioned as well. What drives you is the passion. What enables you is the technology. So remember, look back at my background. What my passion is art. I combined that with computer science to end up in, in a world of doing visual technology. So now I've been working in visual technology for 25 years. And that's led me to do things like video on demand and uh, combine that into that creativity. And one of the things that I have seen about this is I spoke um, and I've attended some of the Computer Weekly events, Women in IT events. And at one of the events, uh, there was a group of uh, 200 women. And I asked them, I said, would you have gotten into technology earlier if you were allowed to study the disparate topics that interest you, not just technology? So raise your hand. 200 women rose, raised their hands. They, were, they essentially said, let me study disparate topics, let me study the things I'm interested in, and that will help lead me into technology. So one of the things to do is to start with kids, as, as young as possible. Find out what engages them, what they're passionate about, what they're interested in, and then give them the technology to be able to realize that. And we can do that through, uh, think, think about if you want auditory feedback, music, you get great feedback from that. Visual feedback, you can, you can do videos, you can, you can do a computer game, you can create a website. Kinesthetic feedback, 3D printing. We can all get that type of feedback. And there's a few companies that are starting to get this. So one of them is Apps for Good. And Apps for Good looks at how do we drive that passion? How do we find out what kids are, are interested in? And then uh, we'll teach them the technology so they can, they can create that, so they can create an app. And it was great, because when I went to their showcase, I got to have a look at what they were doing. And one of the kids, a little boy from Scotland, uh, said, you know, what, I, what I'd really want to do is figure out how to uh, get my family's uh, farm of cows and keep track of all the cows. So he created an app to do that. And there was a group of boys and girls who said, uh, you know what we really like to do is keep track of how much we've walked the dog, but from the dog's perspective. And this enabled them to do that. So that was their idea. They have, they have reached 45,000 students. Uh, ranging in age from 9 to 19, and it's 50% boys and girls, complete split. So what are they doing? They're looking at driving that passion. Now one of the things that I've heard recently that does worry me is I was talking to this amazing woman who is uh, part of the British military, and she was saying that when she was a kid, she really wanted to be an engineer. Oh, she was so passionate about that. She had A's in science, and her teachers, the school, talked her out of it. They said, you don't have A stars. You should study humanities. So she went and did a humanities degree. Now at 30, she's in the military, and she said, I want to be an engineer. And I said, this is great. We're going to pay for you to be an engineer. And she is thrilled. She is so happy to finally get to do what her passion is. The problem is that they're doing the same thing to her daughter who wants to be an astronaut. They're telling her not to be an astronaut. We have to change this at that school level. And remember that what drives you is the passion, whatever that is. What enables you is the technology. So let's, damn it, drive the passion. So the next thing is, why, do, why are women saying no? This is the, these are the reasons I get continuously why they, they're afraid to enter into technology. So the biggest first one that I get is, oh, I don't have a technical de degree. I couldn't possibly do it. I seem to be one of the few people who has a technical degree. 
Uh, there's, I keep meeting people, so one of my very good friends, uh, he studied archaeology, and he's one of the smartest programmers I know. He's worked for Red Hat and Google. His wife has an English degree. She's one of the lead programmers for The Guardian. Don't let that stop you. The next piece is being not good enough. Women are equally as smart as men. Men just bluff more. <laughs> Uh, the next thing I hear a lot about is, uh, you know, oh, you know, if I do this, then people will think I'm being aggressive. Well, being aggressive isn't particularly good because being aggressive is a fear-based activity, so you don't want to be aggressive. But it, people don't necessarily mean aggressive. So one of the things that I get told a lot is that I intimidate the hell out of men. I personally think that's cool. <laughs> My father, remember the rocket scientist, who's 81, is also regularly told that he intimidates the hell out of men, including generals. So I know where I get this from. And I don't think there's anything really wrong with intimidation. Intimidation is fear of the unknown. I think it's a little good to be a little unknown. It keeps people on their toes. So that final piece is a few role models. This is one of the reasons we're here tonight. But one of the things I just saw on the news recently was that we're not doing enough actually to celebrate the women in IT who are already in our companies. So take that time to celebrate the women you already have in your companies because those people, those women, they're the role models of the future. And if you want to be a role model as a woman, just go do it. Do what you love and show by example. So what are the things that women bring specifically to, to uh, technology, well, one, one of them is intuition. And intuition is another word for pattern matching, which is the ability to take lots and lots and lots of information and make sense of it. And that's a really good skill to have in something like technology where you're dealing with big data and lots, and, and lots of things. The next one is uh, thoroughness. And women are typically more thorough uh, than some men and have a higher attention to detail. So that's a useful skill to have. And the third one is empathy. Empathy is essentially remembering that people are part of the technology equation. And that ranges from everything from your colleagues to your clients. So the next thing is what do you need <laughs> to stay in in advance? Now, um, I don't know how many people have seen the film Suffragettes, but uh, at least we're not still there. But you are still going to get some flack. You're going to get people saying some weird things. You'll get some very unusual sexual propositions. Um, and you're going to need some cojones to deal with it. Now I'm from New Mexico, so I know that women can have cojones, which leads us on to communication. So this next thing is there's a thing called a metaphor. And uh, you just did a great job of talking about how we frame things differently, how we look at something. And a metaphor is the window that we place on the world around us through which we uh, delete, distort, and generalize information that comes to us until we create our own perception of what we think reality is. And the research has essentially said that a lot of men in business will use kind of a sports metaphor and do anything it takes to win. Whereas uh, women will tend to do something that's more of a schoolroom and manners kind of thing, do your very best, get a really good grade. And the way that that manifests in the work environment is, uh, is worth understanding the difference between the, the, the ways that, that this has an effect. So I've taken this from uh, John Gray, and he's the guy who wrote Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus. And the reason that I've used him is because uh, women will read just about everything. You know, self-help books, uh, books on communication, all these types of things. Men don't often read a lot of them. Um, but what they've all heard of is Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus. A few have even read it, and a few have thought it was good. And the reason I'm using him rather than something that has been under female research, for example, is because this presentation is, is not just meant for the women in the room. It's meant for the men in the room, because we have to do this together. We have to do this. Uh, the men are part of the journey, so we can't do this alone. 
I think it's worth just spending a little bit of time having a look at some of these and understanding because this is absolutely critical. All these things I've run into and all of them have led to issues. So the first one is uh, under the male rules uh, metaphor. Don't put yourself down. It, it weakens your power to lead. In female manners, don't build yourself self up against others. Above others, it creates division. So which one of these do you think is viewed as a better leader? And which one of these do you think can create a more collaborative working environment? Do what's most, most urgent or important. It's OK to overlook the little things. Female manners, everything matters. Remembering the little things demonstrates caring. Which one of these do you think gets the recognition for the big project? And which one of these do you think uh, is there sort of perfecting the details uh, for launch? Uh, male rules, only ask for help if you need it. Men, maps, asking for directions. <laughs> You're respected by what you do on your own. Female manners, giving and receiving helps generate a sense of connection and team spirit. Now these are these are stereotypical, but they're all differences that I have experienced personally. And some of them might be done by men and some be done by women. Um, and it's just, it's, it's, but what's important about this is to be aware that these differences exist and to actually respect that having these differences brings different values to the equation. So finally, what do, um, you know, what do we do to advance? So when I talk about diversity, I'm talking about diversity of thought, thought process in being able to think of, you know, study different things, be able to think laterally, having that lateral thinking driving innovation. But I also mean diversity in the stereotypical sense we talk about it now, which is um, non-white, uh, non male, straight, uh, and just thinking through all of that. The ROI piece is interesting because there's be recently been some research that showed in uh, the UK, USA, and India that if you had a diverse board versus an all-white male board, um, that generated over 2014 655 billion of ROI in increase. So I'd just like everybody to remember that diversity drives innovation and ROI. Thank you very much.